Hello again on the Sad Crime Channel. Today's story took place in the United States, in the state of Arkansas, in 2014. Beverly Carter was born in 1963 in Anniston, Alabama, United States. When she was 16, she worked as a waitress and met a boy named Carl Carter, who was three years older and would later become her husband. At the beginning of their marriage, things did not go smoothly. Once, Carl hit Beverly when he was driving under the influence of alcohol with her in the car. Beverly noticed Carl was intoxicated and driving dangerously, so she asked him to stop. This angered him, and he slapped her. Shortly after their wedding, Carl had an affair and was careless enough that Beverly found out about it. Despite these incidents, Beverly decided not to end the marriage and wanted to give him a second chance. This turned out to be a good decision, as their relationship improved significantly over time. They moved to a small town called Scott near Little Rock. They had three sons and Beverly took care of the home and children. When the children were old enough to go to school on their own, Beverly decided it was time to focus on her career. She loved her children and enjoyed spending time with them, but she didn't want to be a homemaker forever. Full of energy, she wanted to channel it into something else. Initially, she worked as a receptionist, but over time, she became more interested in working as a real estate agent. She decided to get the necessary license for the job, believing it would be perfect for her. She was right. It was her dream job. Beverly loved meeting new people and showing them houses where they could potentially live. Because she loved her job so much, she put her heart into it and soon became one of the best real estate agents in the area. This job also helped improve their household budget, which had been tight when Beverly wasn't working. After she started working, their financial situation improved. They weren't rich, but had no debts. As their 20th wedding anniversary approached, the couple decided to celebrate it more grandly than usual. When they were young and got married, their wedding was modest because they couldn't afford a big celebration. They decided the 20th anniversary was a good opportunity to make up for that. Beverly and Carl renewed their wedding vows and threw a party bigger than the one they had 20 years earlier. However, their lives were not without hardship. In 2003, the Carter family faced a tragedy. Their 19-year-old son, Christopher, died in a car accident. This was a devastating blow for the entire family. Despite his young age, Christopher was married with a child and it was hard for everyone to return to normal life after the accident. Since Christopher and his wife had lived in Scott, Arkansas, Beverly couldn't bear the constant reminders of her deceased son everywhere she went. So she decided to move to Sherwood, a nearby town. However, they didn't stay there long and eventually returned to Scott. The pain of losing her son was alleviated by caring for her grandchildren and dedicating herself more to her work. September 25, 2014, started like any other day, though it began a bit differently because Beverly won a contest at her office that day, and the prize was $50, which made her very happy. Her workday was coming to an end, and she had one more house to show in Scott. She was scheduled to meet the clients at 6 p.m., and she left the office around 5.30 p.m. She was excited because the clients were interested in buying the property in cash, which meant a quick sale. On her way to the meeting, she called her husband, Carl, told him she had one more house to show, gave him the address, and promised to pick up something for dinner on her way home. However, by 9 p.m., Beverly still hadn't returned home. Carl started to worry, grabbed his phone, and called her, but she didn't answer. He tried several times, with no success. Worried, he called his son, who wasn't as alarmed. He knew that if his mother's clients liked the house, they might want to finalize the deal quickly which could take some time. To reassure his father, the son decided to go to Beverly's office. Meanwhile, Carl went to the house she was showing. When he arrived, he saw Beverly's car still parked in the driveway. Approaching the car, he noticed her purse on the passenger seat. Real estate agents never took their purses or documents with them when showing a house for safety reasons, as they never knew who they were dealing with and didn't want to risk theft. Carl approached the front door and saw it was open. He went inside, calling out for Beverly, but got no response. He felt the house was empty, but checked the entire first floor, 
second floor, an attic to be sure. Beverly was nowhere to be found. He immediately called his son, who had checked Beverly's office and found she wasn't there either. The office was already closed and no one was inside. All of this was alarming, so the police were immediately notified. When the officers arrived, they were a bit surprised that Carl had entered the house, leaving his DNA everywhere and potentially contaminating the crime scene. They weren't sure if he did this unknowingly or if it was a deliberate act. He could have been responsible for Beverly's disappearance, and his supposed search for her in the house might have been a cover-up for traces he had already left behind. During the interrogation, when officers asked about his relationship with his wife, Carl told them everything. He admitted to having cheated on her many years ago shortly after their wedding, and that he had hit her once, but that was a long time ago and never happened again. He expressed his deep love for his wife and said that his only concern was finding her. Based on his reaction, the police realized he wasn't the person responsible for Beverly's disappearance. Around 1 a.m., Carl received a message from his wife's phone. The messages were brief, with Beverly stating she had gone out for drinks with friends. Carl immediately knew these messages weren't from his wife. First, the style of writing wasn't hers, and second, she didn't drink alcohol. Besides, they had planned to spend the evening together, so why would she change plans without informing him first? Carl wasn't the only one Beverly contacted that night. Earlier, he had called two of her friends from work while searching for her. Both friends texted Beverly asking if she was okay. Since the responses they received also seemed odd, one of them sent a message asking if Beverly had left a red folder on her desk. This was a code they used in their office to indicate danger. If Beverly confirmed she had left such a folder, her friend would know something was wrong. However, there was no response to this message. News of the missing real estate agent quickly spread around the area, and by the next day, many volunteers, along with the police, were searching for Beverly. Several real estate agents closed their offices to join the search. Some people stood by the roadside holding Beverly's picture and handing out flyers with her image and all the information that could help find her. Everyone tried to help as much as they could. The police questioned neighbors living near the house Beverly was supposed to show that evening. One of them had seen a young, tall, slender white man with short, dark hair get out of a black car parked on the lawn in front of the house. Investigators indeed noticed tire tracks on the lawn, which was a clue. The police also needed to check Beverly's computer. Fortunately, her co-worker knew the password, so they accessed it without any problems. There they found Beverly's notes about the meeting scheduled for September 25th. She had recorded the names of the clients, Steve and Crystal Adams, along with their phone number and email address. When the officers began checking this information, they quickly discovered that the names were fake, the email address didn't exist, and the phone number was not a private number. It belonged to a company offering a service through which one could send text messages and make calls for free. The recipient's phone would either not display any number or show the intermediary company's number. However, this information was valuable to the investigators because by contacting the company, they could determine the real number of the person who had been communicating with Beverly about buying the house. This led them to a 33-year-old man named Aaron Lewis, who lived in Jacksonville, about 15 miles from Scott. The police immediately went to his address, but they did not intend to enter the house. They wanted first to verify if the person living there matched the description given by the neighbor. They also hoped that by following him, he might lead them to Beverly's location. At one point, they saw a tall, slim man with short hair. He got into his black Ford Fusion and drove off, with the police following in an unmarked car. Aaron realized he was being followed by the police and tried to escape by accelerating. However, he overestimated his driving skills, lost control of the car, and drove into a ditch. Not wearing a seatbelt, he hit his head on the steering wheel and sustained several facial injuries, so he was taken to the hospital. At that stage, the police couldn't arrest him because they didn't have a warrant yet. They were only supposed to observe him and didn't anticipate the situation would escalate. When Aaron had an MRI at the hospital and was treated for his injuries, 
he decided it was the best time to leave the hospital, not wanting to wait for the police to arrest him. A manhunt for the escapee began. Local TV showed Aaron's photo taken at the accident scene. This case captivated the entire Scott area. Two men who were discussing the case saw a man at a bus stop matching Aaron's description. Convinced it was him, one of them went to the bus stop to ask for bus information to confirm. He had time to take a good look at him and realize that this was the wanted Aaron. He immediately called the police, but before they arrived, Aaron apparently got hungry and went to Subway to buy a sandwich. He was recognized by several people there who were not as discreet as the two men from the office and immediately started shouting that it was him. As soon as Aaron realized he had been recognized, he ran away and hid in a nearby building. He was quickly found by the police and arrested. Aaron refused to admit to any wrongdoing. His first version of events was that he did not go to the meeting with Beverly alone. He was there with his friend. At some point, Aaron left the house and left them alone. He claimed he had nothing to do with Beverly's disappearance and that, when he last saw her, she was with his friend. However, when this man's alibi for September 25th was checked, it was found that he, a soldier, was at his unit, many miles away from Scott, at that time. Many people who saw him there that day confirmed this, as did the logs of his phone, which showed it was in the vicinity of his unit. It was clear that Aaron was lying, but where was Beverly? Investigators tried to get information from him about the missing woman's whereabouts and, most importantly, whether she was still alive. Aaron did not intend to make their search easier, though he gave hope that Beverly might still be alive by saying that whether she lived depended on how long it took them to find her. After all, since he was arrested, no one had been providing her with food or water. Aaron agreed to show the investigators two buildings where she was supposedly being held. They were located in different places, but Beverly was not found in either of them. Aaron explained that his accomplice in the kidnapping had apparently taken her to another location. Since the police could not get any more information about the realtor's whereabouts, they began to review his phone records to see where he had been on that day. This led them to a concrete plant 25 miles from Scott, where Aaron used to work. They suspected that Beverly might have been held there, but the truth turned out to be more painful. On September 30th, when they began searching the site, they found a shallow grave with Beverly's body buried in it. Erin hadn't even bothered to dig a proper hole. Her body was buried just beneath the surface with an elbow sticking out. Her head was wrapped several times with duct tape, forming a sort of mask through which she could not breathe. The autopsy confirmed that Beverly had died from suffocation. After discovering Beverly's body, the investigators returned to Erin, who had obviously been lying to them all along. From what he had said earlier, they had hoped to find Beverly alive, but he had known exactly what had happened to her. When they informed him that the 50-year-old's body had been found, Aaron presented them with another version of events. According to him, he had met Beverly through the Craigslist site, and the pair had been having an affair for some time. They had arranged a meeting that day, but things had not gone as planned, and an accident during intercourse resulted in Beverly's death. Aaron, however, seemed to forget the condition in which he had buried her body and the multiple layers of duct tape on her head. Later, this version changed slightly when Aaron claimed that it was not he who had been meeting Beverly, but his wife, Crystal. During one of their meetings, something went wrong during intimacy, resulting in Beverly's death. The police were convinced that neither version was true and continued their investigation to determine what had really happened on Thursday, September 25th. They then took a closer look at the man's phone records and noticed that on that day, he had been in unusually frequent contact with his wife. They concluded that she must have known more about Beverly's murder, and about a month after the realtor's disappearance, Crystal Lowry was arrested. The 42-year-old immediately confessed and recounted the events of that fateful day to the police. Crystal and Aaron were married, but their relationship was troubled, and they were already separated. Due to financial problems, they could not afford a second house and were forced to live under the same roof. This situation became unbearable for them, and they both wanted to change it. They both wanted to live separately, 
but they needed money to buy a second house. But where could they get such a large sum of money quickly? Aaron came up with the idea of kidnapping someone and demanding a ransom. They just needed to find the right person. It would be best if it were a woman who obviously has a lot of money. Aaron thought that a real estate agent would be the perfect target. They usually have a lot of money, drive nice cars, and often work alone, so there would be no problem kidnapping one. They began looking online for a potential victim and came across Beverly Carter, one of the best real estate agents in the area. She must have a lot of money. Aaron called her to arrange a viewing of a house in Scott. He introduced himself as someone from another state who, along with his wife, wanted to move to the Little Rock area, and Scott seemed like the ideal place. Aaron wanted to view the house alone, but when Beverly found out, she refused to show the house. The rules at her workplace did not allow her to show properties to just one person, especially in isolated locations, as was the case with this house. When Aaron heard this, he was afraid his plan might fail and quickly handed the phone to his wife to confirm that she would also be present at the meeting. This reassured Beverly, and she agreed to show the house to the couple, especially since they wanted to pay in cash, which is always the best option for real estate agents. But when the meeting took place, only Aaron showed up. He apologized profusely, saying that his wife had to change her plans and couldn't come. Crystal also called Beverly to apologize and asked her to send photos of the house so she could participate in the meeting in that way. Beverly was not very happy with this turn of events, but since she was already there and so was the client, she had no choice but to show the house. They looked at all the rooms on the ground floor and when they moved to the first floor, Aaron put his plan into action. He overpowered the unsuspecting Beverly and tied her hands with tape. He had no trouble with this, as Beverly was still recovering from plastic surgeries at the time, including a tummy tuck. She was quite weak and had no strength to resist. Aaron simply told her it wouldn't be her best day and took her to his car, where he placed her in the trunk. Now he just had to take her to the place he planned to hold her until he received the ransom. He intended to demand $100,000 for her release. He drove 25 miles out of town to a concrete plant where he once worked. He remembered that there was an abandoned building on its premises, which would be perfect for keeping Beverly. When he arrived, he realized that was no longer an option. It never occurred to him to check beforehand if everything was as he remembered it. He didn't verify if the building was still abandoned or if he could leave Beverly there. He simply assumed that it would be the same as before. And when plan A failed, and he had no plan B, Aaron had to start improvising. Since thinking wasn't his strong suit, he had to ask his wife for help. He sent her a picture of Beverly, tied up in the trunk of his car with the caption, Help. Crystal didn't want him to bring the woman to their house, but Aaron had already been driving around the city for quite a while, trying to figure out how to resolve the situation, and began to worry that he might eventually be stopped by the police. So, without much thought, he took Beverly to his house and locked her in the bathroom. At that time, Crystal was at work, and when she returned, she saw that her husband had not found any reasonable solution and that the kidnapped woman was in their home. She didn't like it, but they had to finish what they had started. Aaron had already recorded a message on his phone with Crystal's plea, which was supposed to be sent to her husband. She was to ask him to follow the kidnapper's instructions and not to report anything to the police, because if he did, something bad might happen to her. And indeed, the police found such a recording on his phone, but it had never been sent to Carl. Beverly remained locked in the bathroom while Aaron and Crystal pondered their next move. The plan was that when they asked Beverly's husband for the ransom, he would transfer the requested amount to his wife's account, and they would simply withdraw the money using her bank cards. Aaron already had the pins for these cards. There was just one small problem. He didn't have any of Beverly's debit cards. As I mentioned earlier, real estate agents, when meeting clients, didn't carry any documents with them, and the same was true for Beverly. When she was showing the house to Aaron, her purse was in the car. He didn't notice this at the time of the kidnapping and realized it only when they were already at home. He decided to go back to the site and get the cards. 
Crystal was to stay with Beverly and watch over her. He left her a stun gun to use if necessary and drove to Scott. A surprise awaited him there as the police had already been notified and were on the scene. He didn't expect them to be there so quickly or that the matter would be reported to the police so soon. While driving past the house where Beverly's car was still parked, he was even stopped by one of the officers who thought he was one of the neighbors and asked if he had seen anything suspicious. Aaron returned home where it turned out that not being able to take Beverly's bank cards from her car was the least of their problems. Crystal realized that locking the woman in their bathroom wasn't the smartest move, as all the medications she was taking were there. Each prescription medication had a label with her name on it. This meant that if Beverly saw them, she might already know the identity of one of her kidnappers. Additionally, she had seen Aaron's face earlier, which also worked against them. They couldn't let her go now. They saw only one solution to the situation. Beverly had to die. Crystal didn't want to have anything to do with it and left it to Aaron to handle. She just wanted Beverly gone. After ensuring that his wife definitely wanted him to do it, Aaron took Beverly out of the house and drove back towards the cement plant. He wrapped her head several times with duct tape, cutting off her air supply, and when he was sure she was dead, he buried her body in a shallow grave. Crystal confessed to her involvement, so there was no need for a trial, and she received a 30-year prison sentence. Since her husband still claimed he was innocent, his trial began in 2016, during which Crystal testified against him. Aaron continued to assert that he had nothing to do with Beverly's murder. He only helped his wife hide the body. He did not admit that he and Crystal had planned to kidnap the woman for ransom. The recording of Beverly's voice on his phone was supposedly computer-generated, although Aaron couldn't remember which program he had used. He also explained in court why Beverly's face had several layers of duct tape. Knowing he would have to bury her, he protected her face from any insects. After four days of trial, the jury delivered a verdict finding Aaron guilty of Beverly Carter's murder, sentencing him to two life sentences without the possibility of parole. In 2020, Crystal requested that her sentence be reduced by half. She argued that she had found God while in prison, no longer posed a threat to society, and that her actions were mainly a result of Aaron's influence. Crystal also wrote that she realized she had a debt to repay to society and that the best way to do so would be to be released and dedicate herself to volunteer work. While in prison, funded by taxpayers, she would not be able to repay that debt. Her request was denied, and Crystal continues to serve her 30-year prison sentence. Thank you for listening to this tragic story. Goodbye.